Learning the history of graphic design will give you shared knowledge that can help you speak with fellow designers and creative directors, as well as an appreciation of where we've been that can inform where you're going to take things in the future. In this video, I want to share with you three designers that I think you need to know about. Let's go. Hello friends, welcome back to Flux where we talk design, business and everything in between. My name is Matt Brunton and if you're a self-taught designer, it's easy to miss out on a lot of the history of graphic design and I reckon there's some real gold in there. Even if you went to design school, if it was a more vocational program as opposed to a liberal arts university, then you may have missed out on a lot of the story and the conceptual aspects. So here at Flux we want to bring some of the best bits to you. So I want to show you three designers who were working prominently in the 1960s. Now their careers were a little bit longer than that. Unless you're a sports person, your career tends to go more than 10 years. But these three are great examples of work that was done in the period. I want to start with Adrian Frutiger. Uh, he was born in 1928. He was a Swiss designer. And we can see in this book some of his logo design work and we see this uh, geometric form it looks very swiss the whole swiss modernism he was definitely one of the foremost designers working within that space and some interesting things with his logos like this one for institute and antatlique <laughs> my french again is not the best in paris uh, and this was done in the 1960s and we can see the lowercase i on the left but also the whole shape together makes a lowercase a so that's a nice uh, word mark combination similarly with this alpha and omega the greek characters uh, done in 1967 and this sort of approach is is common to a lot of his work you might have seen a lot of these things nowadays but remember we're talking 60 years ago so this is what more pioneering uh, this work here for the National Institute of Design that was actually in the 1970s we can see where the N is created by the negative space uh, the I in the middle and the, the D at the end and and this uh, area logo for this is the 1970s but for auto route rolling out so it's a highway thing and it it looks like a, a road but the whole composition you know comes together angling the A's to, to frame it on either side. So there's some nice details. But I think the reason why we need to know about Adrian Frutiger mainly is for his typeface design. Famous for designing some of the most important uh, sans serif fonts like Frutiger, the one that bears his own name, and Avenir, but most of all Universe. And he designed this in 1957. He subsequently worked with Linotype and worked on updated versions. But this is such an incredibly important typeface. I'd say as important as Helvetica and certainly as useful and as beautiful. And it's become a look which almost looks like a default look, like no design. But of course, that it's impossible to have no design. Choosing something like Universe is a, a stylistic choice in itself. And it just has... Uh, such beauty to it in my eyes uh, in its simplicity and its function and we still see it used in some uh, contemporary identities today it's just as popular and there's been updated versions and now there's there's many widths and weights uh, available and it continues to be a huge seller for linotype universe has been incredibly influential and what that whole style of modernism has done and adrian frutiger is definitely a guy you could learn more about uh, because of his influence. The next person I want to talk about definitely followed along with uh, the influence of that style and that's Muriel Cooper. She was born in 1925 and she's famous for her work uh, with the MIT Press. Now there's some uh, great uh, commentary on her in this book, uh, a new program I'll put it in this camera, a new program for graphic design. And uh, I recommend this if you want something which is more discursive, more academic kind of book. This isn't a how-to about hierarchy and color and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's some great stories in it and it really tells about her work at the press and what she was able to uh, do during her period there. She's important because she was a real pioneer, not 
only because when she finished, she was the only female tenured uh, professor there, but also because of the work that she did. She developed systems. Because the press produced so many books, she wasn't able to be involved in individually designing or art directing every single publication. She had to create systems uh, for the work to enable it to uh, produce the volume that they did. And she pioneered a lot of systems uh, about design and also about uh, the way things were created. She produced a famous book on the Bauhaus, often known as the Bauhaus Bible. And uh, th she made this film where you scan through the pages. It's been recreated uh, recently, this version by David Small. And this was a pioneering technique in the late 1960s to take photographs of a spread. And you can see as it pans through, the grid layout is, is on display. And so you can see the systemization applies to something like a book design, but it also applied to the way she approached her whole job. And if you want to be a leader within design, it's that design thinking applied to the systems that you build, maybe for an identity, something like a book or a magazine publication but also having that systematic thinking and that design problem solving, applying it to the scenario that you're in can uh, bring about a great results within the organization. And it's that sort of leadership uh, that can help you progress in your career too. I think that's why we need to know about her. Also because she pioneered this uh, workshop style where her students were working on real projects and there was a real feedback loop, something that even today at Flux Academy, we employ with the, the community and the feedback that we have for students who enroll in our programs. And that sort of approach, she was somebody who really pioneered that and a more uh, hands-on uh, working style getting to try out different techniques and have that feedback. She's probably most famous for the colophon she designed, which is the printer's mark, the logo for MIT Press, which is mentioned in this book here. But Pentagram actually commissioned a film on this. I think it was the 50th anniversary. Uh, and they created this little animation as a tribute to her to just acknowledge uh, the influence uh, that she put and Pentagram later went back and worked with MIT Press uh, and the, the media department but this logo has remained and I think it's just because it's such a strong iconic mark if you can't quite get it or read it the first three strokes are the M, the next one is a, a, the I, and the one that ascends is a T, and then the final two with the descender and the last stroke make the lowercase p, so it reads MIT Press. And these look like books on uh, a bookshelf or something like that with one pulled up and, and one pulled down. So it has that meaning behind it, but just by being such a solid mark and it fitting the sort of uh, technical and scientific as well as the graphical uh, nature of the department, it's be it's become uh, something that's endured because it's appropriate as well as simple and strong and iconic. And the interesting thing is she actually got this commission because of her mentor, someone who pioneered this kind of style. And that's the last designer we're going to talk about today. And that is Paul Rand. And you may have seen Rand's video, if not, definitely check it out, about when Steve Jobs paid $250,000 for a logo. So it was that much in today's money. He paid $100,000 back in the 1980s, which was Paul Rand's minimum level of engagement at the time. So definitely check out that video. We'll link to that. Uh, but Paul Rand, and we see some of his marks in, in this book here, produced some really famous uh, logos. And that's how he was able to, to reach that level uh, with his work. Like the UPS logo, which has been updated. But I think this simple emblem is pretty much the best form. We have the parcel tied at the top. And it just creates a, a pleasing shield. We have the ABC logo, for the American Television Network. This was designed by him in 1962, and this was recently redesigned, I believe 2021. Um, sorry, not redesigned, they rebranded ABC, but they kept this essential logo because it has such strong fundamentals. It's obvious that it's contained within this round shape, but that makes sense graphically because 
the forms of the letters have these uh, circles. They're created out of these geometric circles. So it works together. And because it's such a, a simple, solid and well-proportioned mark, it finds that iconic quality that having a lot of his logos. And it's just finding that little detail like Westinghouse here, the electric company built from a circuit board. But this logo here, and I think maybe we can see it larger on screen, the IBM logo is probably his, his most famous work. It's something that has endured. This was uh, designed, uh, it began in, in 1956 on this IBM program, and he designed the logo in use today in 1967. And that's crazy. Almost 60 years, 55 years, I believe, that this has endured because... We have this solid cipher uh, with the initials of IBM, but the idea of the lines, which kind of look like how uh, computer screens with the refresh rate there, is just uh, endured. But even when um, screens have changed and the look of things, because he designed such a system and there's been typefaces that have paired well with that, and because it's just such a, a solid mark, and it has that presence about it that a company like this wants that is is everywhere, it has really suited them and it has endured for a long time. And what we can really learn and take away from Paul Rand is designing logos that have some sort of uh, concept and idea behind them, but fundamentally, they have great geometry, great proportions, great balance, and they take on this iconic quality. And they've stood the test of time because even as media has changed and the advent of screens and different devices and the need to show things in uh, small sizes, it has still been something that works because of the simplicity and the fundamentals of this mark have allowed it to endure. Let us know down in the comments if you'd like to see more inspiration from history. Rand's been doing a series on design styles and movements, including Russian constructivism, Swiss modernism, and we'd like to introduce you to some of the leading figures in the movement. So let us know if you'd like that. And until next time, happy designing. <laughs>